Hi, everyone. Great late afternoon. I hope you're all doing well. Um, well, we, we have another all-star panel for you here, and I'll briefly introduce them so that we can just get right into the, uh, right into the matter at hand. Uh, we have uh, Phil uh, Kazarowski. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for Leading Hotels of the World. Uh, Jennifer Barnwell, she's President of Curator Hotel and Resorts Collection. And then we have uh, Emmanuel Vinciguerra, who's the President for the Americas of uh, Vilbrickin. And um, I was nervous about not being able to pronounce those properly. <laughs> and so she'll give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> OK, all right, so there we go. So again, the role of a luxury, uh, luxury traveler uh, is what we'll, we're going to talk about. We have folks who are really well vested in that domain. So, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with Phil, the farthest one away. Hey, Phil, Hello. All, the way, all the way over there. Um, so uh, I guess the question for you is, uh, what is the state of the, the luxury traveler? And I'm going to make it a two-part question to give you a little more time. It's the state of the luxury traveler, and then how independent hotels fit into that, into that domain for that, for that traveler. Sure. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks, Alex, and, and thank you for, uh, for inviting us to be here. It's, it's pretty crazy to be sitting here and, uh, and seeing people like in person and not uh, in two dimensions, so the, the three-dimension uh, audience. So, um, but just by way of background, so uh, for those that don't know, uh, Leading Hotels of the World, we're the largest uh, pure luxury independent uh, collection in the world. Uh, we have a uh, little over 400 hotels in, in 20 different countries. We're proud to have some of the most iconic hotels in the world. Your, uh, the Ritz Paris, the Hassler in Rome, the Villa d'Este uh, in New York, the Greenwich Hotel. Uh, we're also um, um, uh, feel honored that two of our hotels were recognized as two of the best hotels in the world this year. So uh, by Travel and Leisure and Condé Nast Traveler, the La Mamunia in uh, Marrakesh and the Nayara Tented Camp in, in Costa Rica. Uh, and then we've got a few uh, right around the corner, the Malibu Beach Inn, uh, the Parker Palm Spring, Springs and the and San Ysidro Ranch. Um, so it, it's, it's an honor for us to, to have uh, such great uh, hotels in the collection and also, frankly, the hoteliers, the GMs, are, are, are true, true rock stars of, of, of the industry. So, um, and our mission at the end of the day, and it was interesting um, with uh, some of the conversations earlier, earlier today about brands and and having a true mission and a purpose. Uh, we exist to uh, make sure that we can help our hotels remain independent, which I think is something that's uh, incredibly important, you know, and, and, and many of you in the, the audience under, understand that. Uh, and what makes us a little bit different from many others is we're actually owned by about 60 of our hotels. So at the end of the year, uh, all of the proceeds or all of the profits that leading hotels makes are reinvested uh, back into the company, uh, and really just at the end of the day, just to, to drive our, our hotel revenue and drive their, their success. As far as the, the luxury traveler, um, first off, 90% of revenue this year is, is, is from leisure. And what we saw through the pandemic, um, whenever travelers could travel anywhere, they, were, they did it immediately, whether it was for some reason, the Swiss, like, it was almost like COVID didn't exist in Switzerland. They continued to travel there. Once borders opened up, um, they, were, they were traveling there as well. Um, luxury was very local. Um, you know, they, um, just as an example, even this year, so the United States is our largest market for travelers, and we've seen uh, about a 60% increase in bookings uh, for domestic travel in the U.S. over 2019. Uh, so luxuries local is, 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 a, is a very big trend for us. Um, the other is, is the lift um, or pent-up demand. Um, because the U.S. is our largest um, uh, outbound market and then uh, our, most of our hotels, or the inbound markets are in, are in Europe, um, once the travel restrictions started to lift in Q2, we saw pretty significant growth. Uh, you know, travel into Italy was up, you know, two to three times. Uh, same for Portugal, for, for Spain, for Greece. Uh, so again, as soon as travelers had the ability to travel, uh, they were absolutely out there and, and, 
and braving the, the, the new travel environment. Um, besides the lift of the pent-up demand, we also saw like, hey, there's some things that are getting back to normal. We saw our cancellation rates um, going back to uh, about 20, around 2019 levels, except for the last few days. I think <laughs> we're starting to see some spikes in some parts of Europe and, and South Africa, hopefully that um, you know, doesn't grow uh, too significantly. Um, and also uh, booking trends. Um, during the pandemic, it was our, our booking windows typically 30 to 40 days. We were seeing a lot of just weekend travel. Hey, you know what? I'm leaving this weekend. I'm going someplace local. Uh, and now we're starting to see that with long haul travel coming back. We're starting to see that uh, return as well. Uh, so at the end of the day, luxury is super resilient and our travelers for sure will, will travel as soon as the opportunity presents itself. So could I just tag on one, uh, something real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing a difference in urban markets versus um, resort type markets? Um, and maybe just explain that. I know that connects to, you know, to sure. other questions. But sure, absolutely. I mean, the, I've had many conversations with our GMs in our resorts. They've had the best years that they've had in, in, in a very long time. Um, cities have been trailing, although, um, I was just talking to a few of our GMs in New York, and, and they're looking at, they're about four, uh, for their on the books in future months, they're, they're about four times ahead of where they were last year, and a few of our hotels are actually just about sold out for the holiday season. So I think we're starting to see the cities come around, but the majority of the growth has absolutely been in the resort or any place you can go and get space, as well as what they're booking. We saw villas and suites um, uh, significant growth, um, uh, close to almost 80% year-over-year increases in, in villas and suites. And that's actually kind of a question I have uh, about this traveler is, are they going to go back post-COVID and not book suites? Like, I, I don't know <laughs> if I see that happening. So I, I think that's a, a, a potentially a, a sustained impact from, from, from the, the pandemic. That's great. Uh, so, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to move to you next and uh, talk about... Uh, what luxury travelers are looking for. So what are the unique experiences that they're looking for? And has that evolved? Has that changed? Or is it just, is it amplified now? Yeah, uh, I'll start really quickly about Curator for those that don't know. So we launched Curator Hotel and Resort Collection um, a little over a year ago. And uh, Phil and I are like-minded. It's for independent hotels. We love them and want them to sustain. Uh, so we have a, a little over 80 hotels in the collection today, and the member hotels are given access to um, all of our offerings, which include over 60 master service agreements, benchmarking reports, some uh, proprietary systems, insurance programs, et cetera, a whole, whole lot of benefits. Um, and in terms of you know, what we're seeing, I think there's definitely a huge market for experiential travel. And, you know, I feel like it's the independents that have always been on the forefront of that. It's their history. You know, today they're the innovators, they're the creators. Um, and so whether it's, you know, unique experiences through um, the interior design, you know, I can speak to some of the hotels and the, resorts in the curator collection, interior design, art, you know, having an immersion <clears throat> in your sense of place, the amenities you provide, you know, we have a hotel, Little Palm, that is, you feel like you're on an exotic island and you're actually in America. You're just, you know, all the way at the tip of Florida. Um, it's an amazing experience. Our Skamania Lodge um, in the Columbia River Gorge, we've built tree houses there to have an immersive experience uh, in the forest. <laughs> and then we put in zip lines, we put in axe throwing. It's, you know, this beautiful Columbia Gorge experience. So. You know, we see that the luxury traveler wants that. And again, I hate to be a broken record. I know Phil just said it and some of the other panelists said it too, but we've seen amazing demand at our resorts. It's definitely the luxury traveler. They have the ability to combine work and play. They can stay longer. They have the means to travel. So as soon as things open up, you know, they're on that plane with their families, um, with their spouses, maybe even by themselves. But we've seen the resort locations specifically perform really well. And again, the urban location's not 
so great, um, but hopefully they'll be back, you know, sooner than later. You know, listening to Michelle, hopefully there'll be some more corporate and group demand next year mm -hmm. for them. And um, I would agree that independent hotels do have an advantage in providing unique elements and unique services. Not that the big brands can't, um, but it, it's definitely something unique that, you, that you're building on. It's so. actually, uh, if I can uh, just jump in, an, an sure. interesting thing, <clears throat> an evolution of that as um, related to the pandemic was how we saw our, our hoteliers innovating out of necessity but something to get them through the pandemic that's actually, hmm, maybe this is something that we want to continue in the future. As an example, uh, the, we had the Dang Le Terre Hotel in, in Copenhagen um, that they converted their Michelin star restaurant into takeout. Like, who would have thought about that a, a year and a half ago? Um, we had the soccer hotels who converted a number of empty guest rooms into private dining areas. And they've said that's absolutely something that they're gonna carry forward. And then on the marketing side, you know, how to target you know, their local markets as opposed to their traditional feeder markets. So I think you know, some of the hopeful energy and the innovation that we can take away from that is how do we keep that sense of creativity, of agility, uh, and you know, apply some of this and keep that momentum into the future. Mm -hmm. That's right, and it's just a testament to how resilient hotel and restaurant operators are. They really are resilient, and they seem to get hammered about every 10 years with something, whether it's the economy, whether it's a pandemic, or, or something uh, terrible like that. So, but thank you. So, so uh, Emmanuel, I, I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into the, lu the luxury uh, part of things, and... Um, uh, ask you if you think that you've seen a shift in what the luxury traveler is looking for and then you know combine that with products and services that they're looking for and you know, so from your perspective have you seen a big difference or a change or a shift in that yes uh, certainly I think uh, you know the luxury traveler has been uh, confined for many many months and had the time that I would say the luxury traveler but the luxury consumer in general uh, had some time to think about uh, their values and what's important to them. And so we've seen shifts in uh, what people ask for in terms of clothing. They want uh, products that are more comfortable. Uh, they want products also that feel good and people that are well-made. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not uh, a theme that's brand new, but it's certainly an acceleration with uh, post-COVID where people want product with authenticity. And I think, uh, you know, we also had a, an amazing recovery uh, post-COVID uh, because of everything we, we discussed earlier. Uh, the customer is there. The customer is also buying a lot more than before. Mm -hmm. So we are benefiting from that. But also, you know, the brand. Uh, so for those of you who don't know the brand, it's, uh, you know, the reference in, in luxury uh, beachwear and resort wear for 50 years. We are actually celebrating our 50th uh, anniversary this year. Congratulations. Um, and we, we have about 170, yeah, close to 170 stores around the world, uh, many of them in hotels. Um, and, you know, back to the authenticity, the, the, the need for authenticity, because of our history, because this brand was founded in Saint-Tropez in 1971, uh, and is synonymous of joy and freedom and vacation. Uh, we have a story to tell about the brand that really resonates uh, with the client. Uh, and you know, we, we, we like to say internally, maybe we should use it externally, that we are a memories factory because every swimsuit has a history. They're all unique and they've been designed for 50 years. So a lot of our um, luxury collectors and clients own those suits for many, many years. And all the, the memories uh, of those suits are linked to vacation. So that's a big point on authenticity. Mm -hmm. The other one is sustainability. And when, when I say sustainability, obviously it's you know, eco-responsibility. Uh, in 23, we'll have 100% of our swimwear actually made of sustainable uh, fabrics. It's been a, uh, a three to four years journey, but we're getting there. But it's not just that. Sustainability is also uh, repairability. So all of our swim swimsuits are repairable. And that's something that really resonates mm -hmm. to the uh, luxury uh, customer today. There's uh, some other luxury brands that do that, but in the 
swimwear area. We, are, we really are the only ones. And finally, um, to authenticity, integrity. So, you know, we know what we are good at doing. Uh, we're good at doing uh, beachwear clothing. They are the best, they dry fast, they're made for the beach, they're made for the swimming pool, they, they're made for the resorts. Uh, but there are other things that we, um, you know, it's not our expertise. So we're launching our uh, first beach, beach Villebrequin Beach Club next year. Um, we, uh, we are not, uh, you know, specialists of hospitality management. Uh, so we partnered with a company to, uh, to do that. Uh, so it's an extension of the brand. It's oriented towards families, uh, which is a big demand for the luxury traveler. Mm -hmm the ability to actually travel with their children but have an offering uh, specifically for, for, for the children. Um, but, um, but we're doing that in partnership uh, because we, we don't know um, everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, oh, thank you. And uh, I, I think you made a really good point about comfort and I think that's something that people are, are craving in, in many different ways on, uh, and products. And in fact, you know, coming here, I had to remember to put pants in, in the suitcase because when you're on Zoom meetings, right, you only, oh, no. you only, you only need a shirt. And so this would be a really awkward panel um, if, if you're we didn't. You were in shorts. Right. So you just have to, you just have to remember those things. But, but people are really looking for things that are actually, they've been comfortable for a year and working. And so, uh, it's it, it's important. So uh, that that was that was uh, uh, very good for you to share with us. So um, I guess I, I want to uh, move back to um, uh, to um, to Jennifer and uh, and ask you how you think um, the industry is positioned to kind of deal with the demand that that we're seeing now. And it's kind of a shift because we're. we're we're waiting to see some business travel come back in, and mm -hmm. the estimates that we're seeing and we've heard from panelists today is that it's not gonna come back in the same way that it was where uh, the leisure travel is, is booming. The group travel is still a, a, a big question mark. Uh, and so where do you see the, the demand moving and, and do you see our industry being able to absorb that demand in a, and, and particularly your brands being able to uh, um, um, absorb that? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll answer it through the lens of curator. I mean, we specifically don't operate the hotels. We're, you know, um, a platform where we can give the hotels this um, reference point with a whole list of trusted vendors and service providers and products that they know are trusted, tested out. Um, our founding partner, Pebble Brook um, Hotel Trust, is... Um, instituting a lot of the curator offerings in our own hotels so you know we're talking the talk and walking the walk and so if we can take you know some piece of that you know the baseline given like you know you need a parking operator you need an, an AV partner you need linens and Terry and a GPO and you know you can look to curator as that resource and use the, the groups that we've partnered with that leaves the hotel teams hopefully, with a lot more time to focus on what they do best. Like, we don't have brand standards. We don't tell them how to operate their hotels or run their hotels or how their hotels should look. So they can focus much more time on that, and we can take kind of the back end, you know, piece away from them or, or hopefully at least make it a little bit easier. Um, but again, a lot of the hotels in our collection, you know, whether it's the resorts in Florida, um, California, the ski resorts, I mean, they've been living this increased demand really since, you know, early, well, I say mid to early ish 2020. I mean, I can talk from the public perspective. I mean, I think we had all of our, all of our resorts reopened, say, in May, June 2020, because the demand was there. So they've been living it for quite a while. It's been a frenzy, for sure. I mean, there's no seasonality with our resorts anymore. Um, because people are coming to them nonstop and paying very high rates. We really hustled and repriced everything because they are buying up and there's no pushback against that. So I think that's going to continue, you know, at least into the short term. But, you know, we also don't have any thoughts, which I know some of the other panelists said too. It's not like, just for the sake of argument, say, you know, the rates at our resorts have been up 20 or 30 percent, you know, compared to 19 that's not sustainable and kind of we know that because we want to get the occupancy back as well so i think 
it's really detail oriented, hands on, you know, revenue management, looking at the demand patterns, looking at, you know, what the restrictions are in your specific municipality, where your guests are coming from, you know, how far, you know, who can you market to that can drive to you, drive to your resort, you know, all that's going to continue. And then I'll tell you, everyone's poised and ready when the, the group demand is going to come back and some of the corporate demand has come back. Everybody's ready. But in the meantime, at least in you know, these resort locations, we have plenty of leisure to fill in for it. Sure. Well, I, I want to follow up on that and also ask about any operational changes that you've made in, you know, in, in delivering uh, you know, to your guests. And uh, you know, what, what have you optimized? Have you had to take things away? Mm -hmm. and, I, and in the luxury side, you don't know, ever want to take things away. Right. But you know, have you reconfigured things to, uh, you know, to be more efficient or cost effective? Well, we're, we're, where we have the demand, you know, it's definitely a function of the luxury traveler coming back and feeling that. And if they're paying these high rates, they've got high expectations. So in those cases, it's been great because they need food and beverage and want food and beverage experiences. They want all the amenities open, whether, you know, it's a spa or the pool or the beach attendance. So um, all of that has been back for us for a while at those certain locations. In the urban locations, it's been much tougher. So we have had to take thing. I hate to say the words take things away, but it's just the guest doesn't need it or want it and wasn't utilizing it. So we didn't want to provide anything that the guest actually didn't want. So it's a little bit, you know, hit or miss depending on the exact, like whatever city the hotel is in and what the hotel has to offer. And just being, you know, from the ownership perspective, being very flexible because in a lot of cases we had restaurant tenants mm -hmm. and they're just completely decimated. They have no business, so you can't expect them to reopen. So we've been trying to be creative with them and doing, you know, something someone said earlier, grab and goes in the lobby in some cases. In other cases, we kept a restaurant in San Francisco open the entire time and really went hard at takeout and delivery. And that's the way we've been able to keep that restaurant open. Um, and some of it is just about choice. We're big believers in offer the choice. So that housekeeping is like that. It's like, if you really want your room cleaned, we'll do it, but it's up to you. And early on in the pandemic, nobody wanted to see anybody or interact with anybody and didn't want anybody in their room. So we could save on that, on staffing and expense, but it's ultimately what the guests wanted. And that's what you want to do at the end of the day is give the guests what they want. So it's been very selective based on each hotel type and right. location of that hotel. Different for the different types of markets that you're exactly. in as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, good. And so I, I guess, Phil, I wanted you, you, know, you to chime in as well with, your, you know, with the hotels in your portfolio. Have you seen any changes in operational um, efficiencies, uh, or uh, or is are things just kind of going in the same way that they were before? Yeah, I, I for the most part, our hotels are not, especially the ones that are um, charging significantly more for their nightly rates. They're they're not they're not taking taking things away. Um, so, I, I think what what more becomes is is where are there opportunities for them to operationally think different um, as a result of the COVID-19. So, you know, what I mentioned, you know, before about uh, changes they're making to the F&B and how they're functioning within, within the local community. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, they understand that they have, um, the, the guests have high expectations. Uh, and you know, I think they, they are being hit by, uh, you know, some of the similar challenges around, um, you know, staffing. Um, you know, I think they're, they're seeing and understanding that that's something that, um, you know, I think the, the comment before was uh, that the guests are kind of giving our, our hotels a little bit of a pass from a, um, you know, from, from a quality perspective. But, um, you know, they're continuing to look at ways to, to just think differently about how they deliver their services. Right. And I think we all, and we can all think about ourselves when we travel. The first time I stayed in a hotel 
where they didn't come to clean the room, I had forgotten that that was a thing, right? <laughs> I, I was like, oh yeah, they don't do that. Uh, it wasn't a, in a luxury hotel, it was a you know, mid-scale hotel, and at that point, it was upon request, and I didn't get the memo about requesting it, so <laughs> I had a pile of dirty towels on the floor, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's not gonna work so well. And so, you know, there's kind of this, you know, this, this give and take that you have to figure out with your guests and make sure that you're not, you're not shorting them. And then the other question I had, it's an operational question, but I wanna connect it to the traveler. Um, are, are you seeing, um, are you seeing, uh, increased uh, cost of cleaning and uh, you know, doing the things to, to, to provide, uh, uh, I guess, a, a sense of safety for the guests so that when they're walking into your properties that they feel safe. When, when I was uh, growing up in the business, I was always told the guests shouldn't see you cleaning, the guests shouldn't see you doing all of the things that are important to them having a great experience. And now it's almost like if you're not wiping down the table right before they sit down or if you're not vacuuming the floor as they're walking in, they tend to, you know, they're, they're like, well, oh, it's not, it's not clean. And we used to make it clean invisibly and now I think we have to make it more visible. Are you seeing a need to do more of that because I, I walk around here and there's 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 sanitizing stations all over the place there are wipes all over the place and uh, I, I think guests want to see that and it's hard it's harder in luxury because you want to be elegant and Clorox wipes don't kind of you know you can maybe put in a, in a gold cover you know, <laughs> you know solid gold and just you bring know, your own and we just yeah, we right. tell everyone yeah. to wipe it down yourself. You can etch their name <laughs> you know you can etch their name in it and then they you know they have you know what you know those are things that you could do but um, are, are you seeing the need to you know to do more of that and are your guests asking for that is, is the question. Forgive me for my you know my foolishness there. Yeah. I was just trying to. I mean I I'll, I can start with that quickly. I mean I think. In the very beginning of the pandemic, it was just a race and it was like a frenzy. It was like, oh my God, we need to figure out every new cleaning product there is on the market and every piece of equipment and figure out if we can get it in and all this PPE. And there's two sides to it. There's, you of course want guests to know how clean your hotel is and you've taken the efforts to do that, but we need to keep our employees safe too. So we were trying to balance both sides of the equation and we didn't we didn't want to give guests what they didn't want, which was in the very early part of the pandemic actually cleaning if they were staying over multiple nights. But we also didn't want to endanger any of our hotel team either going into a guest room where you don't know if that guest is sick or not and make sure that our entire team has appropriate PPE and that they feel safe. So I think at the beginning it was a lot and it was very serious and it was you know super hands off. but. You know, we had people cleaning in the public spaces kind of every hour or so and wiping everything down and not going into hotel rooms until people checked out, like an hour after checkout or we weren't even that busy, so we'd let rooms sit for a couple of days thinking it would just magically all, like any virus would disappear. <laughs> but that was pretty early on. Um, but then after that, I mean, it did, for us at least, it did subside a little bit and we took our guests' cues and yes, we definitely still have the sanitation stations and generally it's, you know, housekeeping on request or, you know, overnight service on request if you, if you want, again, because we're proponents of what the guest wants. Um, but we didn't, you know, go to these extremes. We just follow the CDC guidance and AHLA's guidance and it's um, kind of normalized a little bit over time, I would say. Uh, there's one, you know, there's one other element uh, regarding that too is that as, as an operator, you actually want to be in the room to see what's going on, to clean up stuff before it becomes, you know, a it's problem. It's a disaster. Right, and, right. right. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, that's another important thing to, you know, help keep your renovation costs uh, down as well. If, if someone's in a room for a week and you don't get in there, you know, God knows what happens in there, right? So you have to be careful. Um, Good. So as we're winding down with, with time, I wanted to leave the last question to Emmanuel um, to, to share maybe a little bit of how you see your business blending with the luxury traveler and, and how that enhances the experience that they have. And we see your, sh your shop right here and, um, you, you know, how you see that as a big, you know, as a big part of the experience for the guest and, and how you've developed those relationships, not only with the guests, but with the companies that are, you know, that are supporting you. 
So <clears throat> I would say that uh, you know what, one of the things that has changed also through the accelerated through the pandemic is the fact that the 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 guest or the customer needs wants to shop anywhere and get the same uh, the same level of service. So we've we've developed a lot of ways for the customer to shop from you know shopping online and picking picking up in store picking up. Uh, in the location of their choice or shopping in one store and picking up in, in another store. As far as, um, as far as hotels are concerned, we, 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 th we thought there was similar demand uh, for the customer not to, be, not to have to go to the store, but still being able to get what they need. So we've put in place this um, in-room delivery service uh, for, uh, for luxury travelers where they can actually order products on our website and they get delivered at the hotel the day they arrive. So it's a pre-booking. Uh, in general, the hotel works with us uh, and, and uh, reach out, reaches out to the customer before uh, he or she arrives uh, to the hotel. They make the choice and then we deliver the, the product. And we found that you know, that's an idea that we always had because we don't have stores in every single hotel, but we definitely, the luxury resort uh, traveler definitely buy, buys our products and knows our product very well. So we wanted to bring the Villebrotin experience to the hotel. And uh, with post-COVID, that's something that's, that's really uh, working very well. Um, and, uh, and it's just one of the, you know, new omni capabilities that we've brought to, uh, to, the, to the company, specifically for um, hospitality. Excellent. Well, thank you. And so we have a little timer down there that's flashing red now. So that means that, uh, that, our, that our time oh, is up. Oh, we're over. <laughs> but I, I want to see if we, we probably can steal a minute or two uh, of time if there are any questions for, for, from the audience. Uh, to this amazing uh, group of uh, panelists. And the cocktail hour is very soon. <laughs> <laughs> very near, I'm getting that, I'm getting that sense. But um, I just want to thank uh, all of you for coming and sharing thank you. You know, everything that's going on. It's very important to everything that we all do in, in this business. And, uh, and we can't do it without folks like you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.